the go live button. Yeah, somebody to look at watch over your shoulder and and tell you that that you're not just destroying glass. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for those of you who just uh, just joined us, uh, Pam was saying that she uh, ground her own mirror for a uh, for a six inch. Uh, was it a Dobsonian or was it a? Oh, okay. Well, I think that's right though. Start with the part that you're most likely to to ditch, right? Everything else comes together relatively straightforwardly. To illuminize it. Oh, really? Huh. Why? So you, you know, you heat it up and then it's it's like a molecule thick on the surface of the mirror. Yeah, yeah. But I want to star test it first. So. Huh. Okay. Um, people are saying that you were muted. I think I fixed it. People oh. have to tell me. That's why we have this five minutes beforehand. <laughs> People are telling me there's audio issues. Tell me that I fixed it. She's not muted anymore. I fixed it. Stop <laughs> yelling at me. Come on. Okay. Um, there we go. Okay. Yeah, I solved it. Hello to Fifth Dimension, Andrew Planet, Beth Johnson, Bob Caplow, Bob Moeller, David Dunn, Froden Gautier, Horizon Brave, Ian Farquhar, Johnny Zed, Larry Beckham, Larry King, Nancy Graziano, <laughs> Nifty, Raj Luthra, Arjon, Sergusi, Stephen Hawkins, Trey Harmon, and Zaffin Zaffin. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Uh, yeah, roll call. Um, trying to think what's uh, interesting. Oh, we had a huge fireball uh, over our city two nights ago. I didn't even wow. hear about that. Yeah, over Vancouver on Vancouver area. Island. Yeah, okay. In, like I in the Comox Valley where I live. Very cool. Yeah, and but I didn't see it. You know, like oh no, <laughs> no, I hadn't. Three seen in the morning. I, no, no. I see chatter on Twitter about that kind of stuff, but I hadn't, I hadn't heard any talk about it. I will set up an all sky camera at some point, and then mm. you, know, yeah. you know, because I've seen like one, like I think fireballs are kind of like eclipses. Like once you see one, you want to get more into your eyeballs more into your brain because the one that I saw was, it was about five years ago and it like was, it was so bright. It sort of changed the the color of the landscape. It like lit up the landscape. It, it was bright green, left a trail for about. Have, have you ever heard one? No, it, I didn't there, hear it. There, there is a phenomenon called uh, electrophonic sound where they, they'll people I've, I have heard it one time we hear it hiss off a of meteor. It's, yeah. it's really bizarre. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. 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 So green was, means green means it tells you the what what was the composition. I think it's I think it's copper for green. Yeah. And so like normally when you see a meteor, you like meet like when you're out watching a meteor shower with a bunch of friends, it's such an individual experience because you're like meteor. And like, oh, I missed it. I didn't see it. And then they say <laughs> meteor. And like, oh, I didn't see it. But these, you know, with a fireball, you're like meteor. And like, where? And you're like over there. And like that bright thing in the sky. Yeah. And then you all watch it together. And you call your friends and they look out the window and everyone just watch this, <laughs> this thing blazing I, across the sky. I saw the Leonids from Kuwait in 98. And it's, oh. that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Mm. That's better than a solar eclipse. I thought it was pretty amazing. I saw, I saw the Leonids from downtown Vancouver and it was still terrific. Yeah. Wow. Like, you know, that it was just like meteor. Meteor. <laughs> it, it shows you what meteor, meteor showers can be. Yeah. yeah. Where most meteor showers, you see one or two. You were seeing that every few seconds. Yeah. Yeah. A storm. A true yeah. storm. storm. Meteor yeah. storm. Yeah. yeah. I would and love to see that. It was the first time I think that we had one well predicted. Like we knew that it was going to be a good one. And so we went mm -hmm. out yeah. and, and watched it. About every 33 years, the Leonids come around. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay, we've sort of reached the five minute mark, so it's time to put you all back into your boxes. <laughs> Over to me. Find my intro. Okay, here we go. 
Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, March 24th, 2021. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of the Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about the Ingenuity helicopter is about to take flight. A new Nova in Cassiopeia, uh, a conjunction with the moon, and uh, a possible plausible explanation for a Muamua. Joining me this week on my screen, I've got uh, Alex T. Hey, Alex. Hey, Fraser. How you doing? Wait, I got to show you. There you go. Say that again. How you doing, Fraser? <laughs> Good. Good to see you. Thank you. <laughs> not, not like we're going to add that out, but at least now people who are watching can uh, can see you live. Um, excellent. Uh, we've got uh, Dave Dickinson. Hey, Dave. Hey, two weeks in a row uh, as a substitute. Yeah, th- yeah, you pitched. <laughs> yeah, you pitched in last week, and then this was going to be your regular week. What, what, what's going on in the background there? That, that I have, binocular. I have a pair of giant binoculars from Explore Scientific. Unfortunately, I can't keep these, but I'm putting them through their paces for astronomy gear today, another site I write for. But they are, to see the ISS through these, it's pretty freaking amazing. Mm, Really? (laughs) You can actually see the little, you know, with with most smaller binoculars, you can see a little, it looks boxy, maybe a little structure. With these, it almost doesn't look real because you it's it's got a wide enough field you can follow when the ISS is going over. And wow. I had a pass when I had them out the other night. You could see the the panels look like a little tie fighter. What's you know? the what's the aperture? They look like seventy millimeter. They're, they're a hundred and twenty each, I believe. One hundred twenty each, two hundred twenty millimeter, millimeter yeah. binocular. So it's really like two refractors side to side by side. Like yeah. Two, 120 millimeter refractor side that by side. It just seems wow. really civilized. Yes, please. Yeah. 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 No, they're pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. What 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 do they run? Two thousand dollars for this set. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Not Two terrible. 120 apochromatic refractors <laughs> bolted together. Yeah, that, that seems to make <laughs> yeah. sense. All right. All right, and on my screen right now we got Pam Hoffman. Hey Pam. Hi, Frazier. All right, before we uh, kick into our special guest, I just want to give everyone a reminder to join the a wonderful community that goes along with the show, the Weekly Space Hangout crew. They are our friends, our family, our executive producers, and if you want to be sort of go deeper into the space fan community, you should join the crew. Go to wshcrew.space and they will they will embrace and welcome you, give you everything you need to become an executive producer of the show so that you can invite really cool guests onto the show. And speaking of really cool guests, we've got uh, Dr. Casey Honeyball from Vanessa Goddard. Yep. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, so I, I always ask people, uh, who are you? What do you do? Who are you? What do you do? <laughs> I'm a lunar planetary scientist or lunatic, as we <laughs> like to call ourselves. <laughs> is that the official? Is that on your doctorate? Uh, I wish. That would be awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. And you're, I said you're at NASA Goddard, and there's sort of a, a, a hint to what it is that you do there sitting uh, behind you. Yeah, so I'm a postdoc at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and right now I am a lunar observer studying water on the surface. And uh, NASA Goddard, of course, is the the home, I guess the operational home of the Hubble Space Telescope, the uh, James Webb and many other spacecraft and, and missions. Um, but uh, but you work with SOFIA, the yeah. flying observatory. Uh, I, I work with SOFIA. I propose to observe on SOFIA and sometimes I get to fly. Um, so for, uh, I guess for people who don't know what Sophia is, although that looks like nobody who watches this show, everybody knows what Sophia is. We're giant Sophia nerds. We've had the folks from Sophia. We talked about it many times, but just for anybody who doesn't know, what is Sophia? So actually this model right here shows the airplane, which is a Boeing 757. And it's a flying telescope that flies about, uh, what is it? 14,000 feet or I think that's it, above commercial airliners. Yeah. And then in the back, there's a door that opens up to a large telescope. And then it flies through the air, observing uh, usually astronomical objects like uh, far-off galaxies, uh, molecular clouds, star formation. Um, but we like to use it for something really close to home, the moon. Now, what what problems does Sophia solve that, that a regular 
telescope at the top of Mauna Kea or somewhere in the Chilean Andes can't get done? Yeah, uh, so because we're looking at water and the Earth's atmosphere is just filled with water, we can't actually look for water on the moon or many other places because of this atmosphere from ground-based telescopes. I actually also use the NASA Infrared Telescope Facility on Mauna Kea to study hydration on the surface of the moon. But the problem is that the, because the atmosphere has so much water, it absorbs all the signal coming from the moon. And so basically there's just this gap in what we in our data. So we can't really get as much information that we want. And so SOFIA, because it flies so high, it's above 99.9% .9 of the atmospheric water, which means that we can actually receive some of the water signature from the moon. That's what makes it so special. Um, so it's, it, I mean, it's kind of like a space telescope that takes off from the earth and flies around and you can upgrade the instruments and sit on board and, and, and give it a hug. So it's like, <laughs> you know. When, it's very cold up there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, how, when you when you actually are on an observing run, what is sort of like your typical typical day like? So uh, we have to fly into LAX and then we have to drive two hours to Palmdale, and which is basically in the middle of nowhere. You then you have to go through uh, safety training the day before your flight or the couple hours before your flight. And then you get on the plane, you walk out on the tarmac and everything next to this giant 747 sitting uh, right in front of you. Uh, and it's about dusk time. So sometimes the sunsets are really pretty with Sophia in the background. Uh, when you board the plane, you're on it for 10 hours, no matter what. And it's uh, like sitting in first class when you're in the actual airplane seats. Otherwise, the entire plane is just gutted. And there's like, it looks like NASA mission control, if, you, if you've ever seen Apollo uh, movies and the mission control computers. It's that's what it looks like, except for you're in a, a plane. And then there's this giant telescope in the back that you can kind of see doing its little gyroscopic movements to correct for um, the plane. Is is the you can like see it out the window or can you actually see it mm -hmm. from in, inside? I'm assuming it's, you know, it's it's like separated from the rest of the airplane. So you can actually, there's this wall of instruments inside the plane that you can see, and you can see like the the mounting hardware where the instrument sits, and the instrument is actually inside the plane, like right now, like right there, and it's just kind of like sitting there, kind of doing this little jiggle as you fly. Wow. You can't get too close to it because it's kind of dangerous to be up close to it. So you have this line that you you don't pass, but. It's really interesting to look at. You can't see the mirror, but you see a lot of the like the hardware. Right, and so I guess a lot of your safety training is like stay away from the telescope. <laughs> um, actually, that's not at all part of the safety training. It's more so what happens if you're going to crash. Right. <laughs> like how to get out of the plane if there's a fire on the plane or, or other things like that. Right. All right. So let's talk about your research specifically. And, and you know, we covered your research uh, last year when it was announced. There was a lot of news. But but why don't you sort of let us know what you what you and your team found? Sure. Um, so I'll start with a little bit of background. So in 2009 or prior to 2009 from Apollo samples, we really thought that the moon was pretty dry. We didn't think that it had any types of water present. But then in 2009, uh, three different spacecraft detected this, what we call three micron infrared absorption band that was signifying the presence of hydroxyl, which is just an oxygen and a hydrogen or molecular water H2O like we drink. And this was kind of surprising in 2009 because we didn't think the moon could have any type of hyd hydration. Um, but the problem with this was that they couldn't distinguish between um, hydroxyl and molecular water. And the difference between the two is very important because hydroxyl is like, uh, it's the active ingredient in drain cleaner. And so if you want to explore the moon, you don't want to be drinking uh, hydroxyl, right? And to use it as a resource, it's much harder to use hydroxyl than it is water. So it's kind of important for understanding what is actually there. And it also tells us about the processes occurring on the moon, how the moon formed and everything like that. And so with this three micron absorption band detected, we couldn't distinguish between the two. And so as a graduate student at the University of Hawaii, my advisor, Paul Lucy, and I started wondering, like, water is, we know water. Why can't we detect, like, why can't we make a definitive detection of water on the moon? 
besides the water ice that's in the polar uh, regions and permanently shadowed craters, right? We So we started looking into this a little bit and we found that if we just mo move out a little bit further into the infrared and look at what we call a six micron band, that could tell us whether or not definitively there is water present on the surface of the moon and specifically the sunlit moon because we didn't think water could survive mm -hmm. on the sunlit moon because the temperatures are so high. We thought that it would just dissociate and, and be lost to space or it would migrate and hop to these lunar polar uh, permanently shadowed regions where water ice is being stored. And so we were looking for ways to make this six micron observation because you can't do it from the ground at all. And there's no current spacecraft capable of making this measurement for the moon. And so we were looking for things to do. We thought about high altitude balloons because I have a background in um, observing with high altitude balloons, but then the one we wanted was canceled before it was even uh, a thing to be de uh, built. And then we, we realized Sophia, um, there's an instrument on Sophia that can observe at six microns. And so we, propo we proposed and basically we got I think it was 20 minutes of observing time on Sophia to make this test observation to look at the six micron band on the moon to see if it's even possible okay. to look at the moon with Sophia. Right, if it's even there. Right, to see if the band is even there. We didn't know if we were going to see anything. We had no idea if water could be present. And we didn't have any idea if Sophia could do this because they've never looked at the moon. They've never looked at something so bright. And so out of 20 minutes that was a test, we made a really uh, quite a big discovery that there is water on the sunlit surface of the moon, specifically at the Clavius Crater, which is one of the largest craters that we can see from Earth. Um, and it was really exciting because what essentially was a test to see if the telescope could do it turned out to be a pretty large discovery that, hey, we found water on the sunlit surface of the moon, which we didn't expect could possibly survive there. So that was really neat. And and so, but you were able to do follow on observations in more detail, right? So we have had one other observing run on Sophia where we tried to make follow up observations. Uh, however, the, the telescope is very hard to observe the moon. Like it's not a standard observing program for them. So when we made those observations, there was a slight error in the script that, was cor that wasn't correct. And mm -hmm. so the data ended up not being useful. We're still trying to work with the data to try and pull out the signals to possibly see if we have something usable. Um, and then we have coming up, upcoming observations with Sophia in the next, hopefully in April. Right. I didn't realize that you got that discovery out of that small amount of observing time. I, I assumed yeah. it was like a dedicated flight for that for that mission. But the fact that you made that observation in such a short amount of time, and then I mean, NASA just just, you know, really made a full court press with yeah. what what you had found is is kind of impressive. I guess we're in a bit of a desert right now with instruments that can see into that wavelength with with the loss of the all of the various uh, infrared observatories we don't have Herschel. Yeah. we don't have uh spitzer it's sort of a tough mm -hmm. time to be an infrared astronomer isn't it yeah and that's part of the why it took us uh about a year to figure out how to make this observation because you know you don't have the space telescopes um a lot of the ground ground-based telescopes can't make this observation the balloons weren't flying and like the only observatory capable of it is sophia right now and so that it would was, be amazing if 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 NASA was to launch some kind of giant infrared observatory sometime around like October, James, like this the James year. Webb Space Telescope. Yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> something like that. Unfortunately, the James Webb Telescope can't look at the moon. I gotta say, it's in the wrong place. Because it's, it's in the wrong. It's, on, it, it's too far away. Uh, that's right. It's at one of yep. the Lagrange points. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Ah, and also, stupid. the moon would be too bright for JWST. Too hot. We would we would desaturate too, way, way too fast. Oh wow. So, so that's it. You got Sophia or, or nothing. So let's, let's yeah. talk about mechanisms then. What, where, where do we think this water is coming from? Oh, uh, that's a good question. There's actually a couple of places that we think it's coming from the, there's the three main ones are the solar wind hydrogen implantation onto the moon, uh, micrometeorites, which can either deliver its own water or convert this hydroxyl to water during the impact 
or it could have been brought in by comets before the moon solidified its crust. And so it could be internal water. Those are the three main ideas right now. And I mean, if you actually do have, I know it's not like a lot of water. I think I remember the original press release was like a water bottle's worth of water every cubic meter, some multiplier of drier than the Sahara Desert, et cetera, et cetera. But still, it's water and rock. Dig it mm -hmm. up, grind it up, squeeze it, out comes the water. What does that mean, do you think, for the level of dryness of the inner solar system? Because we've always sort of assumed that it's dry as a bone. But now I think even the observations with Bennu, with mm -hmm. Hayabusa, we're starting to learn a different story about how much water is located within the inner solar system. Yeah, I think, you know, we think that water is such this volatile element that or molecule that just gets lost super easily. And I think we're learning that that's not necessarily true. There's a lot of ways that water can either be formed or be delivered. Sorry, my dog is drinking water. <laughs> you can hear that. It's that, it's that important. Your dog understands. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we're learning that water is capable of surviving a lot more harsh environments than we actually expected. So like the poles of Mercury, they have water ice deposits and Mercury's closest to the sun. No one ever thought that that would be possible, you know? So it's it's showing us that we don't know as much as we thought we did. <laughs> well, there's, that's like not the first time we've heard that said before. Yeah. It's kind of amazing yeah. how much the universe surprises us with, with what the reality is going on. So, I mean, what would it take to truly understand the story of this water? If you could, you know, craft a mission, uh, give astronauts a tool uh, as they hop on their Artemis flight, what what would it take for you to get a really good definitive answer, do you think? So this is actually something I'm currently working on, trying to make a mission that can really answer the water problem. So I think it's really important that we understand water that we know and love and need to survive, but also the other products like hydroxyl and hydrogen that are also present on the moon, because these all play a role in this lunar water cycle. Uh, so all of them are very important. Uh, I would love to have a mission that spanned the near infrared to about mid infrared so that you could really capture both the water ice bands in the near infrared, you could get the three micron band, which is a combination of hydroxyl and molecular water. And then you could get the six micron band that shows strictly molecular water. And then if you could take this spacecraft and you could orbit multiple times around the moon and observe the moon globally at many different times of day on mm -hmm. the lunar surface, this would tell you whether or not this water is moving around, if it's varying across the surface, how it varies. Does it vary with temperature? Does it vary with latitude? Uh, you know, does it, does all the water get supplied and then lost to space? Does it hop to the lunar poles to create these ice deposits? You'd be able to find uh, places where the water might be concentrating. like. Uh, right now I'm starting to look into lunar central peaks that could be showing internal water. And maybe these locations are digging up water that was inside this moon and then deposited on the surface that you might be able to find it in higher concentrations, which could be useful for a landing site for resource utilization potentially in the future. So that's the kind of mission that I would love to see happen yeah, to mean, really answer this question. I mean, it, I'm a, I would assume, I mean, I know that NASA is now planning all, sending all kinds of spacecraft at the moon, various landers, rovers, um, orbiters, people. So, and the fact that there's water on the moon, like it, like half of the missions that are going to be going have searching for water somewhere in their subtitle. So it really feels like that is I mean, if you can actually map out the deposits of this water to a level that's that's useful, that seems like a like a total game changer. But I, so it sounds like your spacecraft will get built. I yeah, I'm, I, I'm I hoping personally so. <laughs> guarantee it. <laughs> some some flavor of it. But do you think that? I mean, an orbiter would be amazing that would actually provide you a, a map of the water. But but to actually sample it in situ, what what would that look like? Yeah, so that's actually pretty interesting. Uh, you would probably have to drill down. You know, the Viper mission is a, a rover that's going to traverse the South Pole. It's going to measure the surface temperature and volatiles 
And it's also going to have a drill that's going to drill down into the surface and, and look at what's below. Uh, I'm not a sample person, so I don't really know how, you know, if you're going to try and extract this water, you're going to have to heat up the regolith. And you're going to either have it, depending on where the water is stored on the regolith, is if it's attached to it, all you have to do is heat it up a little bit for the water to, to be released. And then you have to capture it. Um, if you're if the water is stored internally to the grain, you're going to have to melt that grain, which takes a lot more energy to release the water. So it's it's an interesting question, and I don't quite know how that's going to be answered quite yet. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like a high priority again. Like it sounds like mm -hmm. be one of the list of long list of things of samples and stuff that people will potentially be bringing back. Well, uh, Dr. Honeyball, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. If people want to keep track of the of your work and uh, where should they go? You can either follow me on Twitter at Casey Honeyball or you can follow my uh, NASA Goddard bio, which if you Google NASA Casey Honeyball JSFC, you'll find it. And and when could we expect that next science result from, from you and the team? So I'm hoping to have another paper coming out from IRTF actually on the variation of water uh, using the three micron band and looking at how the three micron band varies with temperature and latitude. Um, hopefully within this next year. And then hopefully also Sophia observations will be able to be done in April. So maybe something about that. And maybe you'll get like 20 minutes or like half an hour. We actually have 40 hours or 20 hours of observing time granted on Sophia. Now we're talking. And yeah. And we're hoping that they'll be done soon. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Well, thank you so much. Uh, total game changer. We're all really excited about what you have discovered and what this means both for the sort of future of exploration and the history of the solar system. So congratulations and, uh, and definitely keep us posted. Great. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. All right, let's move on to the news. Uh, Dave Dickinson, I, I, we got to talk about the, uh, the Ingenuity helicopter. This is such an exciting story. Yeah, coming up, there was a press conference with NASA yesterday, and they gave us a preview of Ingenuity, the uh, the first helicopter to ever fly on another planet uh, with Perseverance that landed last month. They dropped the debris shield uh, this past weekend and exposed Ingenuity. It's nestled up underneath the rover right now, kind of folded on its side. So we're going to see over the next week or so, they're going to start moving to the, the airfield site that they've selected up in front of the uh, rover and start going through the deployment process. They're talking about April 8th, give or take a day or two. They're actually kind of monitoring some variables like, like wind and things like that. And they have to get it down deployed safely and they have to make sure a key thing, it's charging off Perseverance right now. Perseverance is plutonium powered. However, once they disconnect it and put it down on the surface, it's solar powered, so Ingenuity is off on its own. It's got its own little internal heaters and battery and everything else. It's about four pounds, and it's got to function on its own. They have to back the rover off so it doesn't shadow the uh, helicopter, so it actually can get out in the sunlight and charge up on its own. They've been running charge tests right now, bringing it up to charge, letting it drop, bringing it up to charge. So we're, they're hoping next month to get about five flights out of it. And I know we've joked around here that uh, the first thing you do when you've got a drone is you go out and fly it and crash it. And crash it, yeah. And, yep. and th this is all just a proof of concept. Uh, it has a camera, it has a main camera on it. I think it's a five megapixel and a half megapixel uh, nav cam. It has a laser altimeter. Wow. It has some very rud rudimentary d uh, devices. There's really no science objectives for this mission right, other than to fly a helicopter on another planet for the first time. Now there's another helicopter in a couple later this decade that does have a lot of science objectives, which is Dragonfly, which is nuclear powered and going to Titan. So that is actually, uh, we're going to see this kind of helicopters flying on other planets and other moons very soon, but this will be the first. Now you mentioned that it's got a heater on board. So that was one of the first things that I was sort of thinking through the, as an issue, which is of course, we know that, that if you don't have a plutonium source on board, then you're really the, the length of your lifetime of your spacecraft or your rover is dependent on how well yeah. you can warm your, keep yourself warm during the long Martian nights. 
And yeah, the, this is, they're looking at maybe a month. This one's going to operate and they're hoping to get five flights out of it. First flight, they're going to do about three meters. They're, they're going to be very cautious, of course, on the first ones. Uh, you know, they might be a little right. more ambitious in the later ones. That's usually how everything, like remember with Cassini, they didn't do the really dangerous parts of the mission, like going through and looping through the ring planes and getting close to Saturn until the very end of the mission. They don't want to destroy the mission right off the bat. Right, so, so they're not just going to YOLO uh, like my kids and the drones yeah. that I bought them. But we should see actually Ingenuity is going to image uh, Perseverance. Perseverance is backing off at a safe distance so the the helicopter won't hit. We don't want it to hit Perseverance when it's flying around, but they're going to image each other. So we should kind of see those. The way it looks is it's not really gonna be a so live. Crazy. It's gonna be cool. It's gonna be, it's, it's gonna be, they're gonna put up the commands the day prior it's going to go through and execute and do everything that they're going to do, fly, image each other. We'll probably see the NAVCAM images maybe later that day or the next day. So it's not going to be quite a live event kind of thing. Well, it's kind of like when they landed. Once, you know, it takes the signal, takes a while to get back to Earth. So by the time we're going through all the steps of, you know, it's deployed and the chute's deployed and the back shell's off, that's already happened. So I was telling yeah. my wife, it's like, this has already happened or not way off wherever it, we're just kind of seeing the timeline just reaching us but it's just it's so crazy to think that we're going to have a picture from curiosity a video perseverance. sorry from sorry from perseverance a video really i'm sure they're going to yeah. make a video of the helicopter taking off and then we're going to get a view from ingenuity of perseverance and, and they're going to do about 30 at, frames a second. At a so different they're, they're perspective, have, yeah, yeah. We, I mean, we should see a flying around video, at least of that. That If it does only one flight, it does one flight. But they're, they're hoping to get five, and they'll get more out of it if they can. But We'll, uh, no, we'll be able to hear it? You know, I don't know. I know they have a microphone, a yeah. pair of microphones on board Perseverance. Yeah. I don't know if the air is, is too tenuous to be able to. You know, they might, what I mm. thought the other day when I was listening to the press conference, they have a set of pyrotechnics that they're going to use to release ingenuity from where it is underneath. And, and I kind of was wondering, nobody asked that question, but we, hear like, that. I wonder, we might hear the pyrotechnics, you would think, if anything, because it's on board yeah. Perseverance. So. Yeah, I've, I've heard three sound bites from yeah. Perseverance already. Yeah, we've yeah. had the we've had the, the it driving. We've had the laser zap, 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 zap zapping. And I think. Mm -hmm. We had the we had the the, loun the landing sounds and yeah. the wind, yeah. The wind. And yeah. I think we talked about earlier when Perseverance landed that the, the whole backstory of getting a microphone to Mars has been a very this. It's been tried. Let's see, Mars Polar Lander had a microphone. It crashed. Um, what was the other one? Insight had a microphone. It didn't operate. So this is the third time that they've tried to actually, and they've actually got a microphone to work on Mars. Yeah. It's been, <laughs> yeah, it's it's good. Although I, I not gonna lie, a little underwhelming. I think the yeah, uh, the sounds from Mars are like you know Mars could do better. Mars could be more interesting sounding. Yeah, I thought it was cool. <laughs> I, it's cool in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's like with the ingenuity, it's drawing up a lot of public interest. So it seems like there's a there's a really big uh, fascination out on social media about this uh, flying the helicopter. So it's it's good PR, I guess, to have a microphone yeah. as well. Horizon Brave is saying I missed the the laser zapping. It sounds like you starting to trying to start your car, but the battery's dead, and it just goes yeah. tick 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 tick. That's that's the laser. What it's I'm like, it is I'm not waiting. what you were hoping, which is like something out of Star Wars. What I'm hoping to see, and we'll see this in a couple of years, if they do the sample return, they're going to have to land nearby. And if Perseverance is still operating, it may witness the landing of, because, you know, the nuclear power source, that will go for a while. Yeah. There's a good chance we might get a ground view of the sky crane type. <laughs> I don't know if they're going to land the sample return mission as a sky crane as well. That's something yeah. that's still out there, but that's going to be cool to see, to actually yeah. see Just, it from the ground perspective. Well, I mean, not only that, I mean, we got two shots of, of Perseverance landing, one from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and one from the ESA ExoMars mission as well. Yes. So it's, you know, the more infrastructure that we have on the surface of Mars, the more views we get of, of all of this. I, yeah, it's, it, th it's They're great. probably gonna have to land, I mean, they don't wanna land on top of Perseverance, so they're probably gonna have to land off by a kilometer or two, yeah. but it, still, it should probably be able to see it. That would be kind of cool. There you go. Er Eric Wan has got it exactly right. The uh, like a gas grill starter. That is exactly the sound. If you yeah. start your gas grill and you turn on the gas and then you press the button, and it goes tick 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 tick. 
that is what the laser on Mars sounds like. I think you, you nailed it. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, I can't wait to see that, uh, that fly. All right, uh, Pam, let's talk about the, uh, all of the cool stuff coming up this month. Sure. Thanks, Fraser. It's very interesting because it's kind of like a world tour, world's tour for the next few weeks because the moon is going to appear in conjunction with all of the planets in the solar system. And so I'll just start off with the general stuff. Uh, Mercury, Jupiter, and Saturn are in the east right before sunrise. Mars is still really great uh, in the kind of south southwestish. It is starting to fade, though. I can definitely tell. Best is a cool binocular object in the tail of Leo. And maybe, just maybe, we'll get to see that nova that's visible in Cassiopeia. That's Oh, uh, spoiler. Yeah, in, in the evening. I, that's all I'll say about it. It's all in right, the evening. Right. We'll talk about it and more you want to catch it quick. But yeah, I, that's it for me. Um, and so for specific kind of days, the 26th Venus is in superior conjunction. So it'll be Venus, the sun, and then the Earth. So it's sort of opposite the sun from us. The 28th is the full worm moon. It's so that means we can't see it. No, we can't see right. it. And I'm, I'm kind of like, they had to deduce that to get that specific point in time, I, I'm sure, right? I mean, it just makes sense to me. It, yeah, um, it's a math thing. You can't observe it because it's on the other side of the yeah, sun. Yeah, right, right. Uh, March the 28th is the full worm moon, and it, it is also a super moon, one of like four in the next few months. Uh, then March the 29th is Mercury and Neptune are in conjunction. And then we have Pluto and the moon, Saturn and the moon, <laughs> Jupiter and the moon, Neptune and the moon, Mercury wow. and the moon, Venus and the moon, Uranus and the moon, Mars and the moon in conjunction. And I mean like almost every uh, every day or every couple of days, the 5th, the 6th, the 7th, the ninth. I'll put this whole list in the comments under um, this video whenever it publishes. And to just bookend that, um, there's a lunar occultation of Mars on the 17th, kind of only visible from from Asia. Though. That's what I was going to ask is if where where would you be able to see that from? Uh, online. I bet they're going to have, <laughs> <laughs> I bet they're going to broadcast it live. I mean, we can yeah. see almost anything now um, online and uh, then we've got venus and we have venus some friends and... in asia uh, maybe we can get some someone observing it i think <laughs> i cool. think uh sharon ahmad and yeah if shaw I think is able to do in... it that would be amazing yeah oh, i'll, I'll shoot an cool. alert out to him oh yeah. yeah that'd be great and alex so then, of course uh, can you get your hands on a telescope uh yeah i don't know i haven't i haven't tried to get a, my hands on a telescope they're, they're floating around have you ever looked through a telescope are you are you one of those oh, yeah. are you one of those exoplanets? Oh yeah, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Those I love math. For the telescope, yeah. All right, all right. No, 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 oh. yeah, yeah. No, I'm a telescope guy. For okay, sure. good, good. Very yeah. cool. Yeah, nothing quite like seeing stuff with your with your with your own eyes. Oh, totally. um, April twenty second, Venus and Uranus are in conjunction, and then we're back to the um, Lyrid meteor shower. It peaks uh, on the twenty first into the twenty second. Uh, that whole date range though is April sixteenth to the like the thirtieth. So you could see them at any time in that range. Um, but that's kind of the, the best time to go out and look for it after midnight on the 21st into the 22nd. Um, Dave, from that list, which one are you most excited about? Hmm, well, that uh, the occultation of Mars would be pretty cool if I could see it. It's not one that I'm going to really be observing. Um, the, the full moon, I know this is the Easter moon coming up, but, you know, it's uh, that's usually a time to pack it in for deep sky observing. Uh, there is a an annular eclipse, I think it's in June, and that's actually going to be across North America. That's a little further mm. ahead, but we're going to see it as a partial eclipse through most of the U.S. and Canada. So that's going to be kind of, I think it's a rising partial here too, which is always neat because you can get it with some foreground objects, yeah. uh, the eclipse, mm. uh, annular eclipse. So that's that's going to be kind of. That's going to be a big deal coming up in June, I believe. And Pam, what and for you with that list that you provided us, which one are you most uh, excited to see? The Nova. The Nova. I really want to see a Nova. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So well, we'll fingers talk, crossed. We'll talk. We'll talk more about that. You know what? You know what's better than a Nova? Seeing a supernova. Um, we almost all right. thought we would at the beginning of 2020. I almost. Um, all right. Uh, Thank you so much, Pam. Alex, what do you got for us? Yeah, so I feel like I talk about Oumuamua a lot, but it's always in the news and people always are, are interested in this in this particular object. The, uh, viewers and listeners probably uh, familiar with this object, but a quick recap, Oumuamua was the first interstellar object ever detected uh, flying through the solar system, and it has puzzled uh, folks ever since. Uh, and uh, really, it has to do with the fact that it was 
um, not just, you know, an interstellar object, which is awesome in its own right, but that it actually was accelerating uh, ever so slightly, but distinctly accelerating as it was on its way out of the solar system. Now, that uh, appears to be consistent with outgassing. You know, you imagine something like a comet spewing out material. And so that's going to, you know, act like a little bit of a rocket engine and, and accelerate the object. The problem was, is that the limited observations that we got, uh, we didn't see any sort of outgassing. You look at it for, you know, sort of these telltale signs, these tell telltale wavelengths, looking for carbon dioxide, say, or water or whatever, uh, didn't see any of this outgassing. So it has puzzled people. And uh, famously, there have been some uh, hypotheses that it is uh, actually an artificial uh, object. It's a spacecraft or a light sail or something like that. Um, and it has a very unusual shape. That's sort of one of the last little pieces of the puzzle. So people have been puzzling about it and books have uh, obviously been written recently about uh, this object. Uh, <laughs> but there's a pair of new papers out uh, from a pair of astronomers, um, uh, Stephen Desch and Alan Jackson, um, looking at a, a still very awesome possibility, but I think is a lot more plausible than the alien spacecraft um, idea. And that is that Oumuamua is a big chunk of uh, nitrogen ice. Now, you kind of think, well, haven't we even examined this before? It seems like a fairly obvious thing to, to check. Um, there have been people that have speculated uh, about it obviously being not artificial in nature. Um, a paper from a friend of mine, Daryl Seligman and, and Greg Laughlin, not long ago, and postulated that it was uh, actually a big chunk of hydrogen ice, which would be mm -hmm. a lot more exotic. Um, and in that paper, they examined the uh, nitrogen ice possibility, and they concluded that it wasn't possible. Um, but this newspaper said that, well, unfortunately, they, they kind of made some assumptions that you really shouldn't make in terms of uh, particularly the albedo or the reflectivity of this object. Um, so in this new pair of papers, they've looked at two things. They've looked at uh, whether or not nitrogen ice is uh, consistent with the observations in terms of not seeing the outgassing, which holds up. Could it you know, create enough outgassing to uh, explain the observed um, acceleration? Uh, they conclude that it can, um, that the reflectivity sort of adds up. Um, and then the question is, which is answered in the second paper, where do you get a big chunk of nitrogen ice? Now we see big chunks of nitrogen ice uh, in the Kuiper belt, Pluto, for example, and Triton, I believe. Um, so the fact that you can have big chunks of nitrogen ice, not really that strange. And so the question is where you get that. And they conclude that it could be something like uh, impactors uh, happening in a, in a Kuiper belt, uh, you know, an exo Kuiper belt. And so, you know, they run the numbers and say, can you get this many impactors to explain uh, this many um, interstellar objects? Based on how they observed Oumuamua, they said, well, there must be a huge number of these objects passing through the solar system, you know, yeah. you know, maybe one, maybe a few every year in order to explain the fact that we caught this one. So you have to somehow reconcile the number of uh, Oumuamua type objects uh, with, you know, the, the creation mechanism. Can we make this many fragments such that there are uh, so many of these uh, floating around? And they conclude once again that, yes, in fact, you know, based on these impact rates um, and the, the, the number of Kuiper Belt objects out there and, and you know, extrapolating that, you know, uh, our solar system is not necessarily unusual in terms of uh, having uh, a Kuiper Belt type uh, system. They say that, yeah, you can actually make a lot of these nitrogen ice fragments uh, enough that we could have seen uh, right. uh, and it's uh, and it. Yeah. And it all and it all kind of fits together. So um, they say, you know, their, their sort of kicker is that this is sort of an exo Pluto that has come to visit us. So I think it's really awesome. I mean, you know, we obviously would uh, love to encounter alien spacecraft. Um, but the idea that we're getting a nitrogen iceberg from another uh, planetary system is super cool. And assuming that we're going to be seeing more of these objects, it's going to be really exciting in the next few years to, to be able to hopefully even go visit these. There's talk about going to, to uh, having a spacecraft kind of waiting to rendezvous with one of these interstellar objects the next time it comes through. Yeah, and I actually had a chance to interview someone who was talking about the developing a sample return mission that would essentially just be an, an RTG bolted onto an ion engine 
And so you would just, <laughs> and then it would have a sample collector. And so it would be sort of like a Hayabusa too, but it would, but it would, it would run this RTG nonstop generating power for this, for an ion engine that would, that would accelerate. And you could probably get like a hundred kilometers per second of Delta V total. So that's enough to get out to one of these, chase down one of these objects and then return back to earth, which is kind of astonishing. Um, the thing that I like about this theory, and I've been following this quite closely, is that you, you know, the objects in the, in the Kuiper belt, the objects in the Oort cloud, these, these icy objects actually don't require much more of a, of a kick to get them out of their planetary system like if you're going to try to go get out of you know if you've got something to say at the earth you need whatever 17 kilometers per second to get away from the from the earth and you know on an escape velocity out away from the sun if you include the earth's orbital velocity but once you're all the way out into the Kuiper belt or the earth cloud you'll need a couple of of kilometers a second to to get that final kick out of there and so it you would feel like it would be most likely that you're going to have these kinds of objects are the ones that are they're just barely held by their star and so they just slip away away from its grass so that seems like yeah, a really that's right yeah very reasonable. very tenuously held on to it that at those uh, enormous distances and one more little piece of the puzzle they say well, you know you can think about this nitrogen ice chunk and they say well how you know how long can something like that survive you know that's another part of the plausibility argument how long can it survive and they they conclude that this thing would have been uh, ejected or lost from its home planetary system only about half a billion years ago right. so fairly young um and so you know th that's kind of at the time when things are most chaotic or you know you know, lots of stuff going on in these planetary systems so it would have right. been lost it has a sort of low velocity right that was another sort of part of you know it hasn't spent enough time in the galaxy getting uh uh, perturbed by stars such that it you know picks up higher velocities it's floating kind of uh, yeah. gently out there so yeah it all kind of fits together it's, it's it's a nice pretty tidy explanation i think yeah when you think about the age that these things could be of course i mean how old can long period comets be they can be old <laughs> they could be they could be four and a half billion years old and still be comet sized although the the outgassing is still a challenge but i guess you know why didn't it outgas is it if it is, because if you brought Pluto, as, as Neil deGrasse Tyson is always famous as saying, if you brought Pluto into the inner solar system, it would turn into a comet and, and grow a tail. Well, so. uh, yeah, I don't, I mean, it certainly grows a tail. I mean, it certainly outgasses. The question is, can you see the, the outgassing with the observations that were made? Right. And nitrogen, I think, is, is quite challenging to observe. So uh, okay. you know, they were looking for more ordinary sort of outgassing and didn't see that. It's not that it wasn't outgassing. In fact, it had to be outgassing to explain the, uh, explain the acceleration out of the, out of the solar system. It would be really interesting if, if we do see more of these, and many more of them have a very similar... Um, a similar profile, then, then I think that that does sort of t nicely tie together this idea that that most of the interstellar objects that we're going to be seeing are going to be these comets and Kuiper belt objects or cloud objects from other star systems. It's a pretty, it's a pretty wonderful idea that we're that you know that these these objects are so loosely held that they're just drifting from star system to star system. There's, yeah, there's super hope cool. for for interstellar uh, panspermia after all. <laughs> um, all right, uh, Dave Dickinson, before we uh, go, let's talk about this uh, this Nova that Pam has been uh, been trying to spoiler <laughs> us. Yeah, Friday morning, I started seeing um, some Spurs tweets going around that there had been a Nova detected in Cassiopeia. And surely enough, we're talking about a galactic nova in our own galaxy as versus a supernova, which are actually fairly rare. Um, then Friday night, there was actually a message came out, an alert notice that cinched it from the American Association of Variable Star Observers that there was, in fact, a nova discovered by Japanese amateurs the night before that was about ninth magnitude at the time. So I gave it a closer look this past weekend, made some finder charts actually went out since I had these just handy to go out and take a look at it. And this peaked about seventh magnitude and it looks like that's about where it's peaking because it's been staying there for a few days. Um, seventh magnitude is, is a good binocular object. Usually if it's above 10th magnitude, I consider binoculars above 10 uh, to six magnitude and the naked eye six magnitude or above. We have had Nova 
uh, Nove that have actually reached up in the realm of second, third magnitude. Mm-hmm. There was one in 2013 uh, in uh, the constellation Delphinus, Delphinus the dolphin that actually got up to naked eye, and that, which is really cool because what you it looks like a star, but you look up there, and if you know the patterns of the constellation to see a new star up there, yeah. you know, like Kepler did when they saw Kepler supernova. And incidentally, I was thinking about the region of that because I had written about um, Tycho star in my first, my latest book. And I was like, this region sounds very familiar. And I looked, Tycho star uh, in 1572, his supernova he saw wasn't very far away. It's still in Cassiopeia along the galactic plane. It was about maybe five degrees from where this current Nova is right now. And I did a back of the envelope calculation because Nova like Nova, like supernovae, you can use as a standard candle. There's a way, a predictable way that they brighten and fade. Yeah. So this one is probably about 30,000. This is my own mm-hmm. back of the envelope calculation, about 30,000 light years away, uh, looking out toward the Perseus arm, probably on the very edge of the outer arm of the galaxy out there that we're looking at. And what they are astrophysically is you've got a white dwarf companion that's siphoning off material from a main sequence star that gets compressed around the white dwarf and eventually that ignites this fusion. There are stars that are known as recurrent novae, uh, like T. Pixidus, U. Scorpii, that that flare like that in uh, every decade, two decades or so, they flare. But this is a new one we had never seen. So it's, it's kind of interesting. We get a nova like this in our own galaxy that we see that reaches up in this range of brightness about once, roughly once a decade or yeah. so. And I did I, a whole table on, I, on I, I love this idea, like, as you said, the you know, the Nova is, is this white dwarf feeding material. And until it reaches that 1.4 times the mass of the sun, and then it explodes as a supernova. So it's, yeah. so it's a Nova until it's a supernova. Yeah, but, these are a little more garden variety. It's like I said, we, we see every year down about ninth, 10th magnitude, usually along the galactic plane, Sagittarius, Ophiuchus, and places like that, we get Novae. But once in a while, we get one that's close enough that it gets uh, that bright where we can see it up into, I don't think this one's going to reach naked eye because it's been hovering at seventh magnitude. I checked this morning for a few days. Oh. If you if you follow the uh, American Association of Variable Star Observers, you can see actually what real-time observations people are seeing worldwide. It's, it's a, they have a great site. You can just type in, it's um, Nova uh, 20, 2021 Cassiopeia. And you just, oh. if you type it in or just Nova Cass, C-A-S. Nova Cass, can, yeah. Yeah, you I can saw a V it. number V one four zero five cast. I thought it was V O five. I was like, there's another. There's other designations too. Okay. I don't have that one memorized, but yeah, it's uh, there. There usually is is a slew of other designations they give it. Got to. it. Yeah. But oh. Nova cast is an, an easy one. When I write it, I like to just say Nova, Nova twenty twenty one cast. If we get a second one, there'll be Nova twenty one twenty cast two. Yeah. <laughs> so cool. All right. Well, Dave, you're on my screen. We've reached the end of our hour. So why don't you let people know uh, what you're working on and where people can find out more? I'm a frequent contributor, Universe Today, Sky and Telescope. I have, of course, with Universe Today, we did the first book a couple of years ago. And we have our deep sky guide that we did just last year. And I'm also reviewing gear for uh, astronomy gear today, astro gear today with uh, Mike Simmons. So that's uh, my latest gig. So three gigs is about what I like to travel. That's, that's, <laughs> that's a good gigs. That's a good. That's a good uh, balance. Right. Of. But your and your astro guys with Z. Astro everywhere. guys with the Z on on Twitter. Awesome. So. All right, Alex. Uh, yeah, what am I working on? Exomoons all day, every day. That's always that's my jam. Uh, trying to get a paper out the door. That's, I saw a paper on scientist. archive today about uh, an accretion model for exomoons. Uh, yeah, I'll have to check that out. There was just a big uh, circumplanetary disc conference uh, that I got to attend last week, and that was super cool. A lot of okay. people talking about how you make moons in discs. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's. Uh, something new out along those lines. Uh, but yeah, that's what I work on. Um, dynamics and obs- observability. Um, that's that's my jam these days. And uh, if people want to uh, follow me, follow me on Twitter at Alex Tichy. Awesome. And Pam. 
Great. Thanks, uh, Fraser. we have still got the book going, but I am writing the second and third ones to follow along with that. Hold, hold the... it. Hold, that was too quick. Hold it back up again. Oh, yeah. Sure. Time. Sorry. There yeah, you go. Yeah, Norm yeah. yeah, there you go. Your itty, your amazing itty bitty explores face down book. There you go. Yeah. Right, Perfect. right, yeah. And so there's two um, sequels to that that are in the works. Uh, but the thing that we're doing now is the Friday night show on Friday nights at 9 p.m. Pacific time and midnight Eastern time in North America. We are on Facebook and YouTube live. In fact, we've got a guest on Friday the 26th. And Nara Tabir of Galaxis Aerospace will be joining us and explaining what she does as an everyday spacer, basically. That's amazing. So, and so where can people go if they want to watch this? On you Do this on Facebook? Yeah, Facebook on the Everyday Spacer Facebook page and on YouTube, also Everyday Spacer, the channel basically is okay. where we show up. And yeah. awesome. Fantastic. Thanks. All right. Uh, I'm going to put everybody back on the screen. I have nothing interesting to report <laughs> apart from uh, just lots of tons and tons of great stories on Universe Today. We've been been super busy on uh, on the site. I think I had one week where I put like 30 stories into my newsletter so it was uh, wow we had a we had a very busy week so um but yeah no it's been it's been great i gotta say uh, uh while uh i've been spending less time on on youtube specifically i've been putting tons more time into universe today and it's been uh, it's been great the great team great writers yeah i'm really ex i'm really excited about everything that we're doing with that um cool uh thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you to all the moderators. Thanks to Nancy Graziano, of course, for organizing our special guest. Thanks everyone watching us both on YouTube and on Twitch. And to all of my lovely co-hosts who, uh, who join me in random combinations every week. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to share your space news. And I know everyone watching really appreciates it as well. Love it. All right. We will see uh, all of you in next week and all of you here in the group with me in some random combination in the forthcoming weeks yep. all right stay safe everybody and we'll see you all uh, soon see ya. all right uh now the challenge to find the button found it okay <laughs>